Okay, so in speech three, I've given you the introduction. And I'm going to go through and talk about each of those three speeches, starting with the one in 1955. Since I'm talking about eloquence and idealism, I'll share some information first about her eloquence in the speech in 1955. Again, this was to Harvard University. You will see here in a minute why she was giving the speech. She says, A more moving event could not have happened to me than the generous sign of recognition from Harvard University of one who was once entombed in the silent dark. So she's got a, an honorary degree or something. Why is this eloquent? She uses really descriptive language, and it's just, you can tell she's passionate about her feelings. Uh huh. Okay. What's the descriptive language? Which part is descriptive? Charles. Um, entombed in the silent dark. Yeah. Entombed. What do you normally have to be to be entombed? Uh, dead. 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 Okay. So she was once entombed in the silent dark. Now Helen Keller couldn't hear, but she knew language very thoroughly. She could have said, you gave me a degree even though I used to be bothered by not having any sound or any light. That's not eloquent. She knew the sounds of the words she, she was writing. Silent, dark. Those sounds are harsh, aren't they? Okay, so what she's alluding to here in a way, who do we think of in our society as having once been entombed in the silent dark? Jesus. Jesus Christ, yes. Okay. So she's not saying, I'm like Jesus, exactly, but she's reminding us of what it would be like to be in silence and in darkness and feel as if you're in a tomb. Okay. Then she says, while in India I saw a tree, the banyan, which resembles my life, facing drought and other inclemencies of the weather, it yet finds ways to send out little shoots from its extremities and they drop into the ground, take root, and put on branches, leaves, flowers, and fruit like the parent tree. Okay, so what's eloquent about that? She can't see, for one thing, that's true. Bon? <coughs> for me, it's, she's describing the way she took on any anything to learn, any sprout, any little tiny thing, and then described it as a tree taking yeah. on those sprouts. Yeah, she could have said, well, I was in India, and by the way, I suddenly remembered, yeah, I'm a pretty amazing person because I've grown and I've learned new things. But instead, she compares her life to this tree, which people can imagine and which they can admire. Right? Mm -hmm. Then she says, my teacher's individuality was like the banyan. So after saying, I'm like the banyan tree because of this, she says, my teacher too is like the banyan. So it's like a, a wonderful partnership, something organic, something strong and, and vibrant that's in her life, even though she used to be entombed in a silent dark. All right, now let's go on to idealism in the same speech. You can, you can see why I'm taking more time than five to seven minutes on this. All right. I've just flown home from the far east where new hopes and dreams are trying their wings for realization in the lives of uncounted multitudes, and I am full of a deep concern for their future. Right. First of all, she was, well, this is 1955. She was born in 1880, so how old was she at this time? 75. 75 years old, okay? In 1955, a lot of 75 year old women were not flying around the world, much less flying and deaf 75 year old women. But she was extremely active. She lived until 1968, actually, so quite a long after that. But she went to the Far East, she went to India, she went to the Philippines, she went to Japan, maybe other places, but at least those three places in 1955, and she says, 
these people, countless multitudes, uncounted multitudes, are trying their wings for, they have new hopes and dreams that are trying their wings for realization. What are you supposed to be talking about? People from like, the poor community, they're still trying to strive for better things. Well, that's true. Certainly poverty was an issue. Why would those three countries be having new hopes and dreams? Because they're young still. Or not young, but they just weren't as advanced as America was. Mm, that, that might be true, but that's not the reason. 1955. What happened 10 years before that? World, World, War. World War II ended. Okay. What happened to India after World War II? Had to rebuild themselves. It did what? They had to rebuild themselves. Yeah, something bigger than that. 1947, they gained their independence mm -hmm. from Britain. the United from Britain. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the second most populous country in the world, mm -hmm. India, left the fold of the Western world. India became something, became a leader in the so-called non-aligned movement. Well, Grace knows about this because being from Jamaica, Jamaica was part of the non-aligned movement too. And Michael Manley, whom she gave her first speech about, was at the top of the list leading the non-aligned movement. Okay. Well, you might think, that's no big deal. People change in different ways. Okay, that happened in India. What happened in China between 1945 and 1955? Great. It went communist. It had a revolution in 1949. Okay? So from the standpoint of the American leadership, in that 10-year period, a lot of very threatening things happened. India was lost to the West. China wasn't just lost to the West, but became an adversary. Then what was going on in Northeast Asia about that time? Korean War. North Korea invaded South Korea. The Chinese came in. Three years we fought until 1953, the end of that war. There's still no peace treaty for, for the Korean War in 2011. The war is still on, officially. It hasn't been ended. Okay. Then in 1954, well, think about Southeast Asia. Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, and so forth. Who did most of Southeast Asia belong to before World War II? Right. The French, that's right. Okay. What happened to the French? Any idea? I know Hong Kong is recently. Yeah, that, Hong Kong is a, a different story. In 1954, the French were ejected from Southeast Asia, from French Indochina. The Battle of Dien Bien Phu was fought, and the French ran away. Well, the leader, the leader of the resistance was a guy named Ho Chi Minh who the United States regarded foremost as a communist. He didn't regard himself foremost as a communist. He felt he was a nationalist, and you can read lots about this. But so in that 10 year period, all kinds of hell is breaking loose around the world from the standpoint of the Americans. Not to mention the Russians. The Russians exploded hydrogen bombs. 1957, they sent Sputnik out. That's a little bit later. But when I went to elementary school in 1956 and 57, we were in Kansas. I mean, you can't get farther away from Russia than Kansas. We were doing drills going under our desks in case the Russians bombed us. And it was very serious. It wasn't yeah. funny at all. It was something we took very seriously. Mm -hmm. So going back to Helen Keller, the reason that this is an idealistic statement is that in 1955 in the United States, if you ask the leaders, you ask the average person, what's going on in Asia anyway? If they knew anything at all, they would not say, ah, oh, there are new hopes and dreams trying to take wing for realization in the land in the lives of uncounted multitudes, and I am full of a deep concern for their future. We weren't concerned about the future of East Asia, we were concerned about our future. We were under threat. We felt we were under threat. So it's, 
it's almost impossible to believe that someone would say something like this in the United States. If she were not Helen Keller, she would have been laughed at or put in prison in some cases for some of the things she said. 